let's see, let me advance a couple of slides. So let's start out by giving you a little bit of background because everybody has a, a different experience with the coronavirus right now. We can't see the forest or the trees because we're all in our own personalized effect that there's no one person in the United States that hasn't been impacted in some way. So a little bit about coronaviruses, how they got their name, it's a Latin term, or Latin root rather, which means crown, and it's based on their appearance. So spike-like surface proteins, being the S proteins and M proteins that you'll see uh, on, on the outside envelope of the virus. So RNA viruses typically uh, mutate pretty easily, and they have some of the largest genomes. They infect a wide range of hosts. So mammals, birds, and humans. And as we've seen in the past 10 years or so, between SARS and MERS and now novel coronaviruses, a number of species of coronaviruses that have been identified in animals, some of which uh, we know to be pathogenic, others we know not to be pathogenic. And being with point mutations and genetic modifications, uh, over time with evolution, we may see more uh, diseases coronaviruses that are infectious to humans. So there are seven that we know that can infect a human. Uh, four of those cause common cold-like symptoms, and three of those are known to have some pandemic potential, being that O2 and O3, we saw an uh, 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 international worldwide outbreak of uh, SARS coronavirus, which transpired across a few countries in Southeast Asia. And then in 2012, in the Middle East, we saw uh, the rise of MERS, Middle East Respiratory uh, Syndrome, which now has kind of been smoldering, smoldered for about three years between 2012 and 2015. And now with the novel coronavirus outbreak that started in, in China and is now expanded to the world. There's only one continent at this at present day that's not affected, and I think that's Antarctica. So looking back retrospectively, and talking about what we know about some of these coronaviruses before this outbreak ever started. So in the Arabian Peninsula, we saw an outbreak in 2012 of uh, MERS coronavirus. And the WHO records about almost 2,500 people that ended up being lab confirmed cases in 27 countries and there were 861 deaths. And it had about a 34% case fatality rate. In Saudi Arabia specifically, there were 1,831 cases and 987 deaths. Now with SARS in 2002, 2003, greater than 8,000 people were infected. There were 774 deaths in 32 countries with a case fatality rate which ranged between nine to 10. And healthcare workers being impacted, um, probably about 20% is the estimate of healthcare workers that actually converted. And then in MERS, there were about 19 to 20%. So typically with these emerging coronaviruses, about 20% of the healthcare workers can be, can expect to become infected at some point. Some of those will progress to hospitalization, others won't. Some of those will request a fatality, others won't. Um, in the case of SARS, there were a number of super spreading events. So in Amoy Gardens, which was apartment complex, and there was uh, the Metropole Hotel. There were a number of super spreading events where one individual would infect a, a whole cluster, created a whole cluster of cases surrounding them. All right. So to tell you a little bit about this particular coronavirus, novel coronavirus, which has been referred to as SARS coronavirus 2, sort of a different variant of what we saw before, because there all three viruses are in the same family, or COVID-19, short for coronavirus that started in 2019, obviously. It started in Wuhan, China. So in Wuhan, China, you will see, if you go to live markets where they sell produce, uh, poultry, small animals, and some wildlife for purchase for consumption, you'll see like in these images, there'll be a number of cages that'll be stacked and in those cages, there's a risk of cross-contamination of species and viral reassortment assortment and that kind of thing, which is one of the reasons why in 04, 05, and 06, we saw H5N1 poultry outbreak in uh, Southeast Asia as well. So you'll have different species of animals that'll be stacked in cages on top of each other, similar to what you see in that bottom right-hand corner. 
And so you'll have feces and urine and blood which cross contaminate each other. So it makes for the perfect storm of viral soup, if you will. And you have these employees that go there, our equivalent of our farmer's markets, right? Um, and they'll go there and they'll sell their, sell their wares. So now you have people who are working in the market that are exposed, as well as they go home and affect their families. You have patrons of the market that go there who are exposed and they go back and, and, and spread disease in the community. And that's how we suspect this started. Uh, there have been a number of species, and we'll talk about them, the specific ones in a, in a second, where they've identified, been able to isolate the virus from. So Wuhan, China specifically, is located in Hubei province, or province rather. <laughs> Let me restate that word directly. And then it's a major transportation hub in China between two major cities. So what we know is the earliest hospitalized case occurred in the week of uh, the first week of December. And some sources say December 1, some sources will say as late as December 8th, it's debatable. Um, basically, we do know it occurred in that first week. The wet market was the likely source. And the case, uh, well, there are a series of cases that were hospitalized that didn't have any contact to the, the market, which we later identified. So there was some person-to-person -person spread. So it wasn't just linked to uh, contact with an infected animal. Going back to the reservoir species. So unlike its uh, fellow family members, SARS coronavirus, uh, we've been able to isolate from bats and civet cats. And actually during the SARS outbreak of 0203, they slaughtered approximately 10,000 civet cats. In 2012, with the MERS outbreak, uh, we saw it a transmission between camels and humans. And now with the current outbreak, they've been able to isolate the COVID-19 virus from bats and pangolins. And a pangolin is a small scaly animal, probably about 15 to 16 inches in length, and they burrow into trees and hole, uh, holes in the ground, depending on the species. They're primarily nocturnal and they're anteaters. So this slide really just depicts, it's an introduction for those of you who don't have an epidemiological background to the concept of R or R not, which is a reproduction number. So for every one person that becomes ill or infected with the virus, how many people will they transmit to or infect? And this is just uh, uh, giving you an example uh, comparing to some other viruses, hepatitis C, and Ebola, and HIV, SARS coronavirus, and measles. Measles being our most communicable virus. So in the case of measles, for example, it's aerosol transmissible. And a person could get on a train and then uh, exit the train car, and 30 minutes later, 30 people could get on the car. And of those 30, on average, 8 to 15 will become infected. So looking at the r not specifically for SARS and COVID-19 and comparing it to influenza, on average, in the SARS outbreak, evidence suggests between two and four are not. So for every person that becomes symptomatic, they will infect approximately two to four other people. With influenza virus, we just have the clear distinction between pandemic influenza and seasonal influenza, but it's still relatively low. So between 1.2 and 1.8 uh, individuals become infected for every case. And in the SARS COVID-19 virus, SARS coronavirus 2 basically, we're seeing approximately 2.2 to that four uh, persons being infected per infected case. So it's very similar to SARS in that way. So identifying an investigation of, of cases whenever you have an outbreak of a novel pathogen is critical. And everything is based off of the concept of a case definition. So this is a little bit older, and during the course of the outbreak, you will see adjustments made to this case definition, because it started out as we were looking for people that had symptoms, being a fever or cough or shortness of breath, and then, you know, either they had close contact to a known, confirmed case, or they had a travel history to affect a country, that kind of thing. And it sort of morphed and evolved, because once it arrived in this country, there were healthcare workers that were exposed, and we know these coronavirus, we can anticipate that uh, clinicians treating patients with uh, confirmed coronavirus and they're symptomatic, likely up to 20% of them will become infected at some point. It's a very high risk. 
And then now with the community spread and more sustained human to human transmission, we realize that we don't, we can't always depend on travel history because most of those individuals didn't have a travel history. They just may have had contact with a suspect or confirmed case. And in some instances, a case that was uh, asymptomatic that they may have not even have been aware of. So this slide just is a CDC slide that depicts some of the symptoms. So let's talk about that. Typically with this SARS coronavirus, most people will that, uh, become ill will present with a fever and a cough, which is kind of hacking, which is odd because normally a hacking cough is indicative of an upper respiratory infection. And it's more of a, a, a lower a lung infection, it prefers the lower lung lobes. And usually you have a more diaphragmatic cough, which is indicative of, you know, retching, vomiting, that kind of thing. But that's not the case. So it's kind of odd. It's, it's a unique distinction. Shortness of breath, which kind of goes without saying when there's a, a respiratory uh, infectious process going on. But some individuals who have had, uh, are in renal failure, have kidney disease, will have renal problems. Some individuals will have gastrointestinal sy symptoms that will manifest themselves as diarrhea. And one of the common things that uh, I have a friend that actually recovered that lives in New York City that was infected with coronavirus that told me that they lost taste and they lost sense of smell before they ever became symptomatic. And there were some individuals that have been identified that have lost taste and smell, but they never go on to develop these other symptoms. And then they go on to get tested and they do test positive. So that's also something you want to look out for. So generally the incubation period is between two to 14 days, but some individuals have presented with symptoms outside that two to 14 days. It is transmitted three ways. So person to person, an infected person coming in contact with another person, uh, contact with infect infected animals, which we really don't see in this country because we don't have people having contact in markets and slaughtering live bats and consuming bats, that kind of thing, or contact with ping pangolins because that's not a species of animal that we have in this country. And then contact with fomites. And you see this a lot in healthcare. So contaminated linen from a patient that had SARS coronavirus or uh, uh, contaminated surfaces or objects or piece of equipment in a hospital, that kind of thing. And then we, when we talk about close contact and person-to-person -person transmission, it's all based off the, uh, the six-foot distance and uh, range of sprays of droplets and aerosols. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second. So this this graphic just just depicts using the Ebola and measles as an example. How when a person coughs and sneezes, over over time, there are heavy droplets of particles, whether it be saliva or nasal secretions, that will settle out. And then as time goes on, the, the smaller particles will some of them may remain aerosolized. So there's an issue with short range aerosols. In the case of measles. Uh, airborne uh, route of infection and tuberculosis, small particles that travel over a long distance, which has been the standard definition for airborne, uh, that would explain why beyond the six feet is critical. So we kind of suggested a second ago this concept of asymptomatic carriers and pauses, and I, I'll give you a, a better example on the next slide. But to start off by saying why there's a, a distinction between symptomatic individuals and asymptomatic individuals. Symptomatic individuals are thought to be uh, more infectious for a couple reasons. One, they have a dispersal mechanism because usually they're coughing or sneezing. Or even if you have a patient that maybe isn't symptomatic and you test them, but you're collecting an MP or a nasal pharyngeal or oral pharyngeal swab and you irritate the lining of their nasal pharynx or the oral pharynx and cause them to cough or sneeze, now they have a dispersal mechanism where they're dispersing droplets or aerosols on you in close range, right? And then due to higher viral loads, obviously when people are the most symptomatic, they usually have more virus that they're shedding versus an asymptomatic individual. And then there might be the possibility where we've seen there some individuals will test positive, but they'll never develop symptoms. So though in January of this year, there was a case that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And a lady had went to a business meeting. She had left China and went to a business meeting in Germany. 
while she was asymptomatic, she had infected four other people. And she later on went to go uh, develop, develop symptoms. So I don't really consider her necessarily an asymptomatic uh, transmitter. She was pre-symptomatic, which would be the accurate term. But then once she infected those four, four people, then they go on to infect others. Who are the case patients highest risk? So CDC is currently saying individuals over 65 that have underlying illness, which may be diabetes, heart disease, some kind of pulmonary disease, they're asthmatic, they uh, are, have active cancer, undergone chemotherapy, for, and they're immunosuppressed, or radiation treatment, or they're immunosuppressed because they have AIDS or HIV that is not being managed correctly. Some, some individuals with a BMI over 40%, I was in a teleconference today, that are suffering from obesity. These are typically people that we see that have more severe health outcomes when they do get infected and start to become symptomatic. And they're not all over 60. Uh, younger people, you know, 50 uh, or, or less can have more severe health outcomes if they have some of these underlying illnesses. And then some of the people that we see that are at high risk, like we said, hospital workers in acute care settings, especially uh, in COVID-19 wars where infectious disease wars where they're treating patients or patients are cohorted, skilled nursing and long-term care facilities. And in the case of Washington, we saw 16 to 18 deaths in, in the skilled nursing facility. You have to think about the healthcare providers that were taking care of those patients. They had redundant exposure to each patient. So let's talk a little bit about treatment. So there really is no treatment at this point. Um, there are a number of medical countermeasures. Obviously, diagnostic testing is a tool because the object is to identify cases and to either route them to quarantine if they're uh, not symptomatic or route them to care if they are symptomatic. And vaccinations, on average, it takes the FDA about two to five years to approve a vaccine. So I don't anticipate we will see a vaccine during the course of this outbreak because there are three phases of clinical trials for uh, safety of, of the community that they have to take the proposed vaccine or therapeutic through. So even though it's on expedite, I anticipate it will take no less than a minimum of 18 months for a approved vaccine to be put on the market. Then there's the issue of manufacturing once it's approved and gone through the clinical trial review and then distribution. So it could be significantly longer than that. Currently, there are two therapeutics. I mean, there are other therapeutics that they're considering, but these are the two main ones that, that, that are under review from, from the FDA. Chloroquine is one that they're really looking at in Canada right now. I know there was a case uh, last week of an individual, he and his wife was in the news, took a, a chloroquine derivative product that was used as a cleaning agent for fish tanks and it had some other chemicals in there as well. But he ended up dying and his wife ended up being on a ventilator. This is one of those things that when we rush medications and don't take them through the trials, I know there's pressure because we're in the middle of a pandemic, but it's not necessarily something you wanna do. And remdesivir is a drug that was developed for Ebola treatment, but now they're looking at it in terms of efficacy for treatment of COVID-19. And so it's, a, I think if I remember correctly, I heard of, of last week that it started the first phase of clinical trials as well. I know that it can be um, acquired through requests from, to, from Gilead directly to their physicians on a compa emergency compassionate use for hospitalized patients. So how can people protect themselves? And this goes beyond the workplace. It also is relatable to your personal life, hand hygiene, obviously. Uh, hand sanitizers, if you can use them, there is no substitute for good soap and water and a good 30 second washing or longer. Uh, if you're coughing or sneezing, cough to your elbow or your sleeve to avoid spreading germs and dispersing those uh, droplets and aerosols as we spoke about a second ago. And then social distancing. So once again, face off of that six foot. And this graphic just gives you another image of what that looks like in a community setting. This is another image that is just making reference to exposure risk on an airplane and that six to 10 feet even distance um, and the risk categories that people fall into based on their proximity to an infected individual who may be shedding virus. So the US, 
let's talk a little bit about statistics. This slide was generated on March 18th. And at that time, in the world, there were 217,072 uh, cases, and increasing every day, obviously. Um, 8,911 deaths. And in the U.S. at that time, there were 7,038 confirmed cases and 97 deaths. 50 states were impacted and the District of Columbia, and there were about 269 travel associated cases and PUIs, just person under investigation. So basically a suspect case, there were 6,493. And then of the repatriated cases, people that were brought back into the country because they were traveling abroad, uh, there were three from Wuhan and 45 from the Diamond Princess. And we'll talk about the cruise ship lives in a second. But as of yesterday, the numbers are staggering. So remember, on March 18th, a little bit over 217,000 cases at that time. We are now up to over 525,000 cases and 23,701 deaths worldwide. And then in the U.S., we have 68,440 cases and 994 deaths. So let's talk a little bit about cruise ship outbreaks. So there was a ship that, that went to Japan and these cruise ships, they go and they dock and they let people off and they pick up passengers and they travel to other destinations and then they come back and they dock. And so there's a constant influx of individuals and social mixing from around the world. And that particular ship originally had 3,700 passengers, 700 of which went on to test positive and there were six fatalities. And some of those I know I can speak to because they were brought back to my home state and they were quarantined at a local Air Force base because anything that happens on water or in the air is federal jurisdiction because it crosses, obviously, uh, potentially state and international boundaries. And then later on, there was a, a cruise ship named, called the Grand Princess. So it originally had a San Diego to Mexico stint and there was an individual from uh, that boat, which was the first fatality in the state of California, which was in Placer County. And so after that, then the cruise ship went to Hawaii, and then that cruise ended on the 21st of February, and then it came back to San Francisco. And at that time, there were probably about, uh, if I remember correctly, 21 or so individuals that had tested positive. 962 of them were California residents, and some were removed. Then there were uh, over 1,100, about 1,200 crew members that were left, 19 of those went on to test positive at a later date. So this slide is just a basic summary of, we have had a declared federal, and most states have declared emergencies. A lot of local jurisdictions have declared emergencies. In my state, all the above have happened. So the local public health jurisdiction, the state uh, the governor declared emergency, and then there's been a federal declaration of emergency and Congress is actually in the Senate are voting on um, legislation to release money to, to people that are in need and that kind of thing and forbearance on things. So in 1944, FDR enacted some of the first uh, public health regulations that had to do with isolation and quarantine measures. And so it gave, gave us the U.S. Public Health Service. So basically they pre their, their whole purpose is to prevent the transmission of disease. So it allows for just-in-time appointment of scientists, clinicians, and public health professionals. It invokes certain travel restrictions. And, and we'll talk about travel restrictions in a second, but that is critical. And then isolation and quarantine measures, with, and it allows for the enforcement of those, mandatory screening for individuals, and then canceling of schools or public events. So how do we stop this particular outbreak? good disease surveillance, whether active or passive, but it's predominantly active, good case identification, because we have two method mechanisms of really reducing the spread. One would be to test every individual and determine who's positive and who's not, and the positive people that aren't symptomatic, we quarantine in their homes, and we continue to test them until they are no longer shedding virus. The other way is, uh, since we had issues with testing in America, and we were kind of behind the eight ball and then there were capacity issues. And when everybody's trying to acquire the same resources, you have 
uh, even getting swabs is a challenge or getting reagents for your test kits is a challenge. So there be a whole host of factors that end up resulting in us not being able to test the numbers of people that we want to. But once you truly know that you have a virus circulating in a jurisdiction, then you can, if you have symptomatic patients, rule them in symptomatically and screen them that way. The problem is a number of individuals have really mild or no symptoms and they may be positive, and we don't know how long they would shed virus or can shed virus. That's not clearly understood or characterized yet, so that creates an issue for us. So that's why testing is so imperative. So let's go on. Okay, control measures in the U.S. So travel notices. A tra level four travel notices do not travel, and there, since this, this slide that was made, there's been a uh, level four invoked. People have been asked not to travel internationally. Level three uh, is avoid as non-essential traveler to certain countries. Level two is a step down from that. And then level one is un basically unrestricted. So in the United States, there are 11 major airports that have quarantine stations. And most of them are international. So what happened when the outbreak started and then people were being repatriated or brought back into the country, there were flights that would normally fly into other airports, but because they didn't have quarantine stations, got directed at those 11 airports. And in particularly in my state, we have three of them. So we have a disproportionate amount, um, more than any other state. So San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. So those people are screened before they get off the plane, the manifest is turned over to local public health so they can follow up and isolate them and that kind of thing and route them to care if they're symptomatic makes contact tracing a little bit easier. And this graphic is just a graphic showing you where those, the yellow circles indicate where those quarantine stations are, the major and the national airports. So what happens if a person has had contact or has been exposed? Their, the rec current recommendation per public health guidelines is that they quarantine in their home for 14 days, and then they follow up with local jurisdictional public health. So it will depend on if you're live on Indian tribal lands, it would be a tribal authority. If you uh, on a military installation, it would be under federal jurisdiction. If you're just uh, 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 someone who works in a, or work and live in multi-jurisdictional area, maybe a state or in some small, smaller states with less capacity, it may be the state because the state may be the only capacity you have. Or if you live in larger metropolitan areas with local capacity, then it may be the local public health. In, in our particular case, everything starts off local in California and then it goes up from there. And one of the things I do want to talk about is so after, especially if you have a case that's been hospitalized and they were laboratory confirmed and they're a confirmed case and they were symptomatic at some point, at some point you have to test them sub subsequently afterwards to see when they clear and they stop shedding virus so that they can be integrated back into the community because you don't want them integrated back into the community before. So even though they've recovered, they may be shedding to other people. So we talked about employee risk, and healthcare workers are a pretty grave risk. And as I saw in a newscast yesterday, there were 160 healthcare workers in Boston, and I know there's a nurse that passed away at, from Elmhurst Hospital in New York. And I know in California, we have over, well, a few days ago, we had over 40 uh, healthcare workers that tested positive. Not all of them are sick, and that kind of thing. But even still, so healthcare workers, the front lines, and it's critical that they mitigate their exposure by reducing it in ways like telemedicine, or some of them have put place IV extension sets on IV lines so they can give medications from outside the room so they don't have to enter it as frequently. And they can also uh, preserve personal protective equipment. There are all these different modifications that have been made to how we do business. Uh, compared to what we normally do to make it safer for healthcare workers. Laboratory workers that may be working with viable virus in the laboratory setting. EMS workers that may have to perform heroic measures on a person that is in acute respiratory distress while they're transporting to the hospital. Different types of medical transport. There have been uh, firefighters, EMS, EMS, and police that transport patients that have ended up converting and becoming positive as a result in America. Uh, public health case investigators. Generally, whenever possible, when they're doing the contact tracing and they have a person under quarantine or they have a suspect case, it's always better, if possible, to do it remotely by email or Skype or Zoom or uh, 
that you can do an interview by phone to see if they meet the case definition of route into care as opposed to uh, having face-to-face -to, -face to reduce their exposure. Some ship workers, whether it be they work in the uh, uh, food service and they're in a cafeteria-like situation in a room full of individuals that are dining, or airline workers or long-term skilled nursing staff, or even longshoremen that are going on and off the ships to take people's baggage and, and, and supplies and equipment. How do we control some of these aerosol infectious risks? Well, reducing exposure by routine things, hand hygiene, cough etiquette, social distancing, which we kind of talked about, screening and isolating patients, and avoiding things like shaking hands and touching handrails and reusable cups and elevator buttons and escalator rails and uh, washing your hands before you're eating, source control of a person is symptomatic, uh, different engineering controls, whether you use closed uh, circuit suctioning or boosts or airborne infection isolation in a healthcare setting, a biosafety cabinet for a laboratory worker, respiratory protection and other PPE, and then uh, other sanitation practices and medical ser services so that you can perform surveillance on your own employees, things like taking your temperature multiple times a day. What is precautionary removal? So precautionary removal basically is the concept of if you have an exposed worker and you know they were exposed to a case and maybe that person converted after the fact before they were wearing PPE, then we send them home for 14 days or longer if needed to quarantine their home. So they're not exposing their other coworkers or they're not exposing anybody in the community or if they all of a sudden become symptomatic at work, uh, we document the exposure incident, route them to care, neither the laboratory or the physician or the employer uh, talks to the, the local public health jurisdiction so they can follow up and do the case investigation of those contacts. In America currently, the recommended PPE, and this is something that will change in the course of, of, of the outbreak as well, because there are issues with a acquisition of PPE, Although the states and the federal government and the local municipalities and even volunteers have come forward and private sector and people in the business industry that maybe you run some kind of healthcare supply distribution company and you have a stock or maybe you're a biotech company and your workers are all at home because everybody is at and the mandatory shutdown and quarantine in their home. So nobody's using those supplies and you volunteer and donate them to a local public health or hospital so that they can respond. But at the current time, N95 are higher respiratory protection. And one of the things we have in California that is kind of unique, we have this aerosol transmissible disease standard. We're the only state that has it. So 5199, which is the regulation for that, in our state requires N95 or higher respiratory protection when you're uh, in the patient room that ha is infected with the novel virus. And we require for high hazard procedures that employers use PAPRs. In other states, it's different because they don't have the regulation and because current guidelines from CDC say drop the precautions, which doesn't necessarily comply with what we recommend. Other PPE includes gloves, gowns, and eye protection. So goggles or a face shield, I've seen some people that have wraparound protection uh, with side protection, kind of depends on their job and what they're doing, right? So if you are in a point of entry in a hospital or outpatient clinic, and all you're doing is asking a person a few questions and screening them and referring them to care and you're not really doing any, any treatment, then it's a, your, your PPE is going to be a little different than you if you are in a skilled nursing facility and you're treating patients who are confirmed positive and symptomatic or if you are working on patients in a negative pressure isolation room setting. So what does respiratory protection require? So for people in the place of employ, other states fall under OSHA. In California, they fall under Cal, you fall under Cal OSHA. And some states do have uh, state OSHA plans, which are unique and they have different regulations that may be a little bit stricter than the federal. The federal is the minimum guideline. So what that requires is a medical evaluation before you wear N95 or high respiratory protection with the caveat that PAPRs don't really uh, have a, a uh, other things like pit testing requirements and that kind of thing. So there's some differences, but still you should be medically evaluated. Uh, annual training and then pit testing, quantitative or qualitative. A lot of people in healthcare settings 
has shifted to qualitative because it, it, it's quicker and easier to do and they can conserve respirators and you don't have to punch a hole in it to hook it up to a port account to measure it. So they can use that respirator for uh, actual patient after they use it for fit testing if they use a qualitative method. And then they have to have a, a, a comprehensive respiratory protection program. So what surgical masks are not? We say surgical masks are great for source control. So I have somebody who's presenting with symptoms and I say go to room number one, it's where we put our isolation patients that we're screening and I want you to don that surgical mask that's in there and I'm gonna call you from outside the room and I'm gonna ask you survey questions. You have a travel history. Do you have these symptoms, so some of which we've discussed before? Are you in a high risk category? And if you answer the question based on your responses, you're going to be routed appropriate from there. If we don't think that you are a coronavirus patient, you may get routed differently than if you, we rule you in as a suspect case, and we may route you to a facility where they can do the testing and isolate you if need be. But what surgical masks do not do? They do not fit tightly to the face. They do not really fall under a respiratory protection program because you're not required to do fit testing and things for them. It's not designed to filter, filter the air that's inhaled by the user. What it's designed for is if you're a person who coughs or sneezes, those large droplets, it's designed to catch some of them. But it still doesn't protect from short-range aerosols because the sides are open and they can spray out the sides. And so there are a number of ASTM, uh, I'm not going to go into great detail, um, standards for resistance and penetrability and flammability of masks and respirators and that kind of thing. And then some of those it doesn't meet as well. So we talked a little bit about California minimal requirements for uh, exposures under the, when you're working with patients that are covered under 5199, the N95 for high respiratory protection, a PAPR for high hazard procedures. And the only time there are exceptions for PAPRs, for example, surgery. So a, a PAPR is cooler and you can work in it for longer periods of time. It's reusable so you don't worry about uh, extended use of respirators in terms of, I mean, it's made for extended use. The only issue is you have to make sure the battery is charged and you have backup batteries that you always have on charge so you can replenish them and a decontamination process. But if you're working in surgery, PAPRs are frowned upon because they're positive pressure and you don't want to blow air because obviously air, air person breathes enough sterile into an open surgical site or wound and potentially infect a person. So in those cases, people will wear a, a filtering face piece respirator. And then EMS operations, because they're in transit a lot and they may not have the battery charging capacity and that kind of thing, and it may not always be feasible to wear a PAPR, they can use a P100. So what are high hazard procedures? High hazard procedures are anything that you do as a clinician that could induce a patient to create aerosol. And like I said, this particular virus has been designated by CDC as droplet. I'm not sure that we really truly have enough data to really discern its aerosol potential at this point because short range aerosols are issued. If you have a patient in a negative pressure isolation room, that does not protect you as the healthcare provider that's going in there to treat that patient. That only protects the people that are out in the hallway. So once you're in there and you're in that patient's breathing zone or you have to intubate them or you have to bag them or you're performing bronchoscopy or suctioning, Basically, you, you're introducing something that could cause them to cough, gag, sneeze, choke, and as a result, what ends up happening, there are short-range aerosols that you could be breathing in. Not just the droplets, but also the short-range aerosols. So that is a concern. In America, and I'm from a laboratory background, so we look at this very differently, but I mean, there are very few exposures that we consider low level because generally, we are propagating an uh, organism that can be pathogenic uh, in culture and growing significantly more larger quantities than what you would normally see that would occur naturally. So our exposure is more significant, so we take everything seriously. But in a healthcare setting, there's this whole three con everything's based off of transmission-based precautions, right? And so there are three different transmission-based precautions. Contact, which is quite variable between entities, and it's quite variable between disease. Obviously, if you're talking about a, a, a child patient with head lice or an adult with scabies and you're concerned about a parasite crawling on you, it's very different and easier to control with gloves than if we're talking about Ebola, where you have a person that is potentially hemorrhaging out of every orifice of their body 
can be found in saliva and sweat and urine and stool. So that contact with that blood and the high viremia puts healthcare workers at high risk, which is why in Ebola outbreaks, we often see up to 50% of healthcare workers getting infected. So contact precautions are quite variable from institution to from institution. And like we said, get after, with the examples I just gave you, from organism to organism. Droplet precautions, our primary mode uh, of transmission and concern is those respiratory droplets, those things we talk about that are heavy that settle. And we're looking at diseases like influenza or pertussis, Neisseria men, meningitis or meningococcal disease. And once again, that's another one that honestly, I would never deal with a patient without respiratory protection because those short range aerosols can be dangerous. And we have documented cases in MMWRs, cases that we've investigated in California, where there have been uh, people that were uh, picked up or a wellness check was done by a police department and they were exposed and some of them got sick. And then they had EMS pick up the patient, taking them to the hospital and EMS workers were exposed, respiratory therapists were exposed, the hospital got sick, e uh, ED workers were exposed. And so the, the notion of you have to have a heavy droplet and nasal secretion or um, a cough and, and saliva and that kind of thing, eh, the short range aerosols, I think it's something that droplet precautions don't really address. And then there's the concept of airborne precautions. So we look at uh, small aerosolized particles and they usually say for airborne precautions it's under five microns, but uh, you know, that's not necessarily true. So you have in your respiratory tract, obviously we sample people for COVID-19, their nasal pharynx, which is in the beginning, stages or areas of the respiratory tract. And then there's some uh, particles that are larger that seat in the uh, primary and secondary bronchi. Some will actually get into uh, the alveolar level. The particles are so small. So it's quite variable with the size of the particle, right? But generally we say less than five microns, which some people can inhale particles up to uh, almost 30 microns. And so the motor transmission is these aerosols and they're thought to be suspended for long term, long a long time over further distances and then be able to contaminate things like HVAC units and that kind of thing. So the first slide, when we're talking about these types of precautions, we're gonna go slide by slide and talk about standard precautions first, which we didn't uh, itemize in the first three when we talk about transmission-based precautions and we identify contact, droplet, and airborne. But standard precautions is what used to be referred to as universal precautions. And generally what we ask people to do in standard precautions is obviously hand hygiene. They use some sort of prote personal protective equipment, uh, gown and gloves. Uh, they don't always wear a face mask. Uh, respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, which are pretty standard you would do in the community anyway. Safe in injection practices and then safe handling of contaminated equipment or services and maybe having some decontamination procedures. We talk about contact precautions Obviously, that was something that we were talking about, which is quite variable based on organism, risk assessment in the institution, and what kind of activities you're performing. And then dispersal mechanism from the patient, right? Is it blood or is it a cough or is it a sneeze? Uh, how is this gonna be dispersed? So places a barrier generally between the healthcare worker and infectious agent. So generally they're wearing gloves. Uh, use, uh, use in addition to standard precautions, gowns, gloves on prior to entering the room and you, and you doff them prior to exiting, and then hand hygiene prior to donning the gloves and after removing the gloves. And usually you want a single patient room because you don't want a, a risk of that patient infecting another patient. Although when you're in large scale outbreaks, an alternative is to use cohorting, which means all the patients have been confirmed to be diagnosed with the same disease. So there's no risk of them infecting the, each other with something else. So if you have a TB patient, and a COVID-19 patient, and you would put the two of them together because you wouldn't want the COVID-19 patient to be subjected to TB, and you wouldn't want the TB patient to be subjected to COVID-19. Whereas if you had emergency hospital that you built, you could put a, have a ward of COVID-19 patients. That's the concept of cohort. So droplet precautions are intended to prevent pathogens via the respiratory droplets and that come in contact with mucous membranes. There is no special air handling or ventilation that's required in addition to the standard precautions, and it can include contact in general. Generally, this is kind of a step up. Uh, surgical or procedure mask is typically donned before you enter the room and discard it at exit. Goggles and face shields are used 
if a spray or splash potential is there. And then a single patient room with a door is, is usually preferred. And then if you're transporting patients down the hallway, that kind of thing, or into a unit for a procedure, they would be wearing a mask as a form of source control in transport. Airborne precautions is the highest level of precautions. It, it generally assumes that it includes contact, standard, and droplet all together because it's the strictest. But agents can remain suspended in there for quite some time, as we discussed before. You have to have increased uh, ventilation rate, so you usually have a negative pressure isolation room that exhausts to the outside or has health to filter there. And so a minimum that we require in our state is 12 air exchanges per hour. Uh, you have to have some kind of respiratory protection program because obviously you have to wear respiratory protection to work in negative pressure isolation. And then it's used in addition, like we said, to standard precautions. And then the patient is also masked prior to transport. This graphic just is an example of what a negative pressure uh, isolation room may look like. They're, they're quite variable. Uh, generally, we like to see them with the ante room, which allows you to have a room outside the room to don and doff, that kind of thing, so you're not slipping out to the hallway and contaminating the hallway. But in worst case scenario, when single patient rooms are converted and portable HEPA filtration units are taken into the room uh, to be, convert a room into a negative pressure isolation room, the design is a little bit different, but we like to see a differential pressure from one side of the door to the other of 0 0.01 uh, water columns. Ideal as a minimum, or ideal is about 0 0.03. Usually you'll see a 0 0.02 something. So novel coronavirus test kits. Let's briefly talk about some of the problems we've had in America. So first, Commercial laboratories and hospital laboratories generally have no interest in diseases of public health significance. And I don't want to say I'm counting them out. In a major outbreak like this, they play their role and we're glad to have them because they have generally more employees than most of the public health system. And they have lots of money and lots of equipment because people, because they process healthcare insurance claims. So in normal circumstances, rare diseases like an Ebola, which you may see once every 15 years somewhere around the world, right? Or SARS coronavirus, which we haven't seen an outbreak since 03, so we may not see an, another outbreak for another 20 years. There's no money in it. So unlike a CBC blood count or a, uh, you know, a chemistry panel where they can test hundreds or thousands of them and generate revenue so they can sustain themselves, there's no money in it. So Typically, they do not have interest in that. One of the things benefits to this outbreak is because of the number of cases, they've been able to bring on a lot of commercial laboratories and hospital labs, much to the benefit of the public health response. So kudos to them for being a part of that response. But typically, what happens is the public health system takes care of these obscure rare diseases. So CDC was developing a real-time PCR. So for those of you who aren't familiar with PCR, basically it's a, uh, a method of testing that was developed in the 80s where you have a family of viruses, SARS, MERS, novel corona, and there are unique segments of that genome. You do a folder genome sequence and identify a unique segment of that genome that's specific to that virus. What we want to do on a, this piece of molecular equipment is amplify that RNA or DNA. In this case, this is a single stranded RNA virus. So amplify it amplify it so we can identify specifically that target sequence that's unique to this virus, which helps us identify it and distinguish it from the other viruses in this family. So in order to approve that test, that test kit in it has reagents and things, primers and probes. I don't want to go too scientific on you in terms of explaining you how PCR works. But basically, CDC develops it. It has to be approved by the FDA. I had never seen in my life a, a a test kit that was approved so fast. So February 3rd, the emergency youth authorization was submitted to FDA, and within 24 hours the next day, it was approved. So typically what happens when you evaluate a test kit is you have to run so many runs on so many specimens from so many patients to validate it to say that it's working as it was designed. And we also like to see the test run in, in duplicate uh, different labs and, and the same results obtained. So basically, CDC ran the test, got certain results, the FDA would run some results and uh, some, some assays and, and, and verify what the CDC was saying, right? 
So a little bit rushed. There were some issues with some reagents eventually not making it into the kit. There were some issues with uh, primer, if I remember correctly. The kits were distributed to state labs across the country. Then there was a recall. So instead of taking that little bit of extra time, maybe a week or two, to really validate it, because of the rush, then there were some issues. And we, it ended up setting us back about six weeks from where we normally would be in terms of testing. So that limited capacity and the numbers of tests because CDC could only run uh, at that time about 350 a day. And obviously we have 300 million people in America. So whenever we get into one of these public health outbreaks, what one of the things that we do do is we develop a specific prioritization scheme as, as to who can get tested based on the case definition and very specific criteria and the types of specimens that are available and the sensitivity and specificity of those specimens in that particular assay. And so because we had a backlog, this slide just sort of takes you through the EUA process, um, we're way behind. So we talked about being able to identify those cases and being able to identify cases means we can isolate them, which means they're not exposing something someone else because the whole concept of a confirmed positive who doesn't have symptoms, but at least we can restrict them from infecting other people. Or in worst case scenario, a person who isn't a confirmed positive that's an asymptomatic carrier, which we said we don't know how long they can shed virus or what have you. It's not clear. Or how many people they can reasonably affect, infect, but it can happen. So knowing whether or not a person is po a positive is critical. So the only other way we could have responded was to institute strict quarantine measures. And after seeing what happened in China and Korea and Singapore and some other Southeast Asian countries and European countries and Iran, so we realized the countries that were the most effective were the ones that institute serious quarantine, strict quarantine measures early. And even if they instituted early, you weren't going to see results from that quarantine that had been instituted for at least two weeks afterwards. So there were still going to be cases coming in because you have to think there's a two to 14 day incubation period. There are going to be people who were exposed right after you institute, institute those quarantine measures that are still going to be uh, developing symptoms, going to be case patients. So what types of specimens are they using or collecting from patients? So initially, they were not recommending sputum induction is, is frowned upon in the healthcare setting because obviously you're causing a, a case patient to generate an aerosol, which is not good for a healthcare worker. So if the person had a productive cough, they, initially they were accepting sputum, but it wasn't recommended that it be induced. And they were also initially uh, getting nasopharyngeal swabs and oral pharyngeal swabs on each case patient and they were run them separately, which also created a little bit of a backlog in testing because you had to run two specimens per patient. And then they went on to change their guidance where they allowed uh, those specimens to be combined, which was good. And then after that, they since discontinued the oral pharyngeal swab and they just say that individuals can collect a nasal pharyngeal swab and submit it. Although there has been some uh, discrepant results in terms of sensitivity and specificity between oral pharyngeal and nasal pharyngeal, so it'd probably be even better if you had both in the same, I mean, you can still submit both in the same uh, viral transport media, so you have a better chance of detection, but now they're only really requiring a nasal pharyngeal swab. So I included this slide because CT value is cycle threshold for PCR, and NT just means native threshold, which is basically background. So if you look at the day of illness, day four, day seven, day 11, and day 12, you will see the CT value increased for nasal pharyngeal swabs for all, and all were positive in some of the preliminary uh, uh, tests that were done. The tests really look at how sensitive and how specific these are these viruses, uh, are these different uh, types of specimens. And then when we looked at oral pharyngeal swabs, three of uh, of them were positive and one of them was negative. So they think that it was a little less predictive of a case identifying a case patient. So I think that's why they discontinued the collection of them. And then there, there was serology that they were doing, but if you look at it day four, day seven, because in general in a human, for most uh, organism exposures, it takes the body about seven days or more to create antibodies. So running serology wasn't really going to be effective 
for day four or day seven when this person, because most of them start to show symptoms between like day four and seven, right? When this person could be symptomatic and shedding virus to other people, you still have a negative result and would be ruling them in as a potential case and referring them to isolation or treatment. So that's why they decided upon MP swabs. So laboratories, uh, CDC did produce some guidelines and recommended for safety, which recommends uh, field uh, rotors or buckets or cups uh, for centrifuges be opened in the BSD, uh, any potential aerosol generating procedure be performed in a biosafety cabinet. I mean, when you're working with a viable virus, you work with it in a biosafety cabinet and you decontaminate with an effective uh, EPA approved disinfectant. And although, you know, the, the EPA has a list of approved disinfectants for COVID-19 on their website, they're adding more and more every day because actually you have to submit for approval. So a lot of manufacturers are submitting for approval now. If you do have, uh, whether it be an employee or a case patient, that is an exposure, obviously you're going to have exposed case patients that you're going to be treating, so you're going to have a whole medical record for them. But just know that if you have an employee that becomes a case patient or starts to have symptoms or exposure, you probably want to notify your local health officer or epidemiologist or health commissioner so they can start to contact, contact trace contacts and follow up with them in case they do convert or route them to testing to make sure they get testing. And then if you have someone who's hospitalized or that is a fatality, you want to make sure that you report to OSHA. Uh, 